You are listening to From the Sea, a podcast series produced by South China Sea Studies. This program provides valuable insights from experts around the world on geopolitical and security developments with regards to the South China Sea as an area in a connected maritime landscape. On November 27, 2022, Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs announced Canada's long-awaited Indo-Pacific strategy, making Canada one of the latest to join the group of countries already laying out their plans for the region. In this episode, Dr. Stephen Nagy, Senior Associated Professor at the Department of Politics and International Studies, from the International Christian University of Tokyo, had a chat with our host about the document with an eye on its distinctions and limits. Thanks for joining us. And today we're going to dive into one of the topics that has been uh, in popular demand for quite a while, which is uh, the Canadian uh, regional strategies or the Indo-Pacific strategies. You know, ever since this has been released, uh, there has been comments here and there about how uh, it is uh, sort of a latecomer to a group full of countries that have already put out their uh, respective regional strategies. The ASEAN has one, US, UK, France, you name it, Italy has one, right? And Japan and India, they all have their own visions. Australia, EU as well. So my first question is, uh, uh, from your point of view, what is the most distinctive uh, features uh, of the Canadian strategies uh, to make it stand out? Uh, you know, in comparison uh, with the others? So this is a great question, and I think um, it's good to start actually with the convergences. And the convergences of all these strategies is that whether it's ASEAN, whether it's the United States, whether it's Japan, they prioritize a rules-based order. And what that means is that all countries, big or small, play by the same set of rules. And this is really, really critical um, for middle-sized countries like Canada and Vietnam. Because if we have to play by rules that are made by big countries, then we will likely lose. So I think that's the big convergence. But in terms of the distinctive, distinctive features, I'll probably say there's three. One is this idea of um, creative diplomacy or new formulas for diplomacy to add value and uh, link domestic priorities to reg- uh, regional priorities. Two is the highlighting the importance of um, di- diversity and inclusion in the region and uh, connecting this to the policy. And three, and I think that this is important, is for, to highlight how Canada, again, is thinking about um, the region's long-term stability and the importance of the environment. So on the first one, um, creative formulas of diplomacy, uh, if you take a look at the policy, there is an interesting area where Canada is advocating for cooperation between uh, Taiwan as a political entity, uh, New Zealand, Australia, on dealing with I- issues of um, Aboriginal people reconciliation through the Pacific, uh, Canada, and um, New Zealand, Australia. And why I think this is a creative form of diplomacy is, um, you know, they're, they're dealing with Taiwan in the context of Canada's one China policy, but at the t- same time trying to create uh, a whole bunch of interesting layers of how we can cooperate with a country, with a political entity that shares a lot of the same values that uh, Canada has. So I think that's really creative. But there's also cr- other um, creative uh, platforms like working with Japan and Korea in terms of. Um, adding security and economic cooperative uh, formulas within the region, um, as well as thinking about how to expand the CPTPP, the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, again, working with countries like Vietnam and Japan and Australia to include future applicants, such as South Korea, perhaps the UK. So that's interesting. Um, The second area that I mentioned is the diversity and inclusion aspect, where uh, these have been deep priorities for the uh, Trudeau government, and um, we feel that uh, inclusive development and mobilizing all parts of society, not just men, but women too and minorities, uh, is really critical to a comprehensive, sustainable, and inclusive development. And this region, we're talking about Southeast Asia and um, Vietnam, um, are important economic partners, and we'd like to see them be more successful. And I think the formula that Canada is looking at is, again, mobilizing everybody as equal parts of the community. And I think this is, this is really, really important. You know, we're, we're men, we have brothers and sisters, we have sisters and grandmas and mothers. We want to see them fully part of the economy, enjoy the benefits that we, we, we enjoy as men. So I think this is creative, and we see this in trying to uh, incorporate these ideas in trade agreements, in development policy, and I think that um, this is really interesting. And the third area is the environment. How can we ensure that this region develops in a way that is sustainable environmentally and help the transition towards a greener, cleaner, and uh, meaner economy so that um, this region is, again, sustainable, green, and it deals with the real environmental challenges that this region faces. So I think those are the distinctive features. Um, they really add interesting value to the region. And they, are broad buy- they have broad buy-in, especially uh, the environmental side and the creative diplomacy side. Hmm. 
I think that's a, that's a great way to uh, sum it up in terms of the three key points. And I was thinking along the line of a different school within the international security study, right? So maybe the three points that you mentioned, you know, on in innovative diplomacies and um, sustainability and inclusivity, uh, I feel like uh, they all share one thing in common, which is uh, a more of a human security kind of approach rather than the traditionalist security kind of approach. I would say that's true. Uh, I think it's partly based on realism in the sense that Canada has a limited capacity to provide hard security goods to the region. Uh, but where it has more capacities is in those three areas, right? Um, inclusive development, the idea of environmental policy, and creative diplomacy. Uh, so in that sense, they are human-centered, but it's also a real realistic assessment of what we can bring to the region that is sustainable, meaningful, and will really add value to the region. Mm. You just mentioned that Canada might have some sort of limitations in hard, hardcore military assets, right? But then I noticed that in the recently released uh, strategies, one of the way to Canada to increase its presence in the regions is via a more visible uh, military uh, presence uh, or deployment. Uh, so uh, how do you think Canada will rec reconcile that, which is the limits in terms of assets and the ambition to drive presence forward? So I think that that is the, the key word, how does it reconcile? The mm -hmm. fact that it has limited um, hard security resources, but it has interest. So um, my personal view is that it'll probably have to focus on different areas. So right now Canada is involved in what's called Operation Neon in the um, waters in and around North Korea to ensure that they don't evade sanctions after their nuclear test back in um, December 2017. And I think that is one particular area that can add value. They may be able to add value in other areas, such as um, helping enhance maritime domain awareness in the South China Sea uh, to countries like Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So those are very limited and targeted areas that they can provide some extra assistance. But I think we always need to distinguish between capacities, that, you know, the sheer amount of things we can bring to the region, versus capabilities. And here I think using technology and using um, you know, quite a... a a high level of, of trained individuals that have honed their skills through working in NORAD or NATO, that those individuals can be brought to the region to provide extra value, human capacity building, and help build um, the, key, the key assets and the key human capital that this region needs to deal with some of the security challenges mm. within the region. So I think it's we have to manage um, again, this idea of capabilities and capacities. Mm. And if we do it smart, I think we can add real value. Mm. Okay, I'm glad that you mentioned uh, some sort of uh, capacity building program and then disaster relief, right? Um, the Quad, uh, which is a grouping of the four countries, uh, also looks into uh, such kind of area in terms of uh, security cooperation in the region. And I know that you have written extensively on the Quad. Do you think that there might be a case for uh, Canada to be uh, a part of the Quad? Maybe not in a official membership, but there is a way to get Canada and even Korea, other middle powers involved? So uh, I'm a believer in what I call the Quad Plus engagement. So um, basically, depending on the activity, ad hoc cooperation, that Canada would plug into the Quad to add value. So let's take a look at an example on uh, maritime domain awareness. Canada has some ba um, capability. It has uh, some capacity. So it could be able to, to plug into um, Quad activities, um, let's say in the South China Sea area or in and around Guam, to demonstrate the capabilities to add value on public good provision that has evolved out of the Quad cooperation. We've seen this in the Tokyo, after the Tokyo summit um, last year. Um, they're talking about infrastructure and connectivity. They're talking about technology cooperation. So this is another area where I see Canada can plug into uh, those parts of Quad activities to add value. Uh, and this is how I think we middle powers are going to have to increasingly see their cooperation in minilateral agreements like, or minilateral partnerships like the Quad, is that they don't have to join it but they can add value um, on an ad hoc basis um, by using their capabilities. And this is kind of the way forward, uh, as many laterals like the Quad have been formulated so they can make decisions. And large, large multilateral um, organizations have a very, very difficult time in making decisions. Mm -hmm. Smaller groups like the Quad um, have an easier time making decisions because they're more aligned. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can't have uh, this ad hoc participation, which mm. I'm advocating for. But how about in the reality? Do you think there is political will from the Canadian government to be attached to the Quad? Because as far as I'm concerned, um, within the text of the Indo-Pacific strategies, there is no mention of the Quad at all. So I think different sectors of the government have different views about this. Um, I think that the Quad has evolved a lot since the uh, initial research and, and uh, discussions about the Canadian the Pacific strategies emerged. Today, I think it's quite clear that, uh, clear that the Quad is very much focused on 
um, public good provisions, but it does have a security side, and that um, Canada is going to need to find a way to engage in it. I do think there's um, recognition that they need to engage in it. The question is how. And they already have. Back in January 2021, at the Sea Dragon 21 exercises, we saw Canada kind of plug in and in an observer status position, um, working with the Quad members to um, uh, you know, add value to that. So I, I think we need creative ways of thinking about how we can engage in the Quad. And it's not so much um, about political will, but it's about charting out uh, a path for that cooperation and define roles and define objectives and define contributions. And I, I think that um, with Canada's pre-existing relationship with all four Quad members, uh, in, uh, bilaterally and multilaterally, it makes sense to cooperate in, a, in mm. this kind of Quad Plus format. Mm. And now I would like to divert it uh, to another also key portion in the strategies, which is the part about China. Uh, I've noticed that uh, Canadian strategies doesn't identify China as um, a strategic competitor or a systematic rival like the version of the US or the UK did, um, and rather have a different approach. But then, uh, because of uh, that approach, I have seen some of the criticisms uh, saying that um, the strategy lacks some sort of uh, strategic uh, uh, sense vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, what do you think about that kind of assessment? Well, I, I don't think um, our Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy should be driven by China or a focus on China. It should be driven by our national interests in the broader region. And how I understand our national interests in the broader region is we want to make sure this, re re uh, this region is stable, prosperous, that it has deepening institutions that contribute to um, prosperity, development, and stability. And that means economic engagement first and helping shape the institutions within the region. Um, that should be the first pillar, and I think that is the first pillar, and second and third and fourth pillar of our strategy. Now, it also identifies other concerns, non-traditional security challenges like natural disasters, like climate change, like the next pandemic. There will be a COVID-20. There will be a COVID-21. So how do we create more stability in the region so this region remains economically dynamic, stable, and prosperous? Because if it's not, it will spill over and have negative consequences for Canada. The last part is the traditional security issues. And China is not the only traditional security issue in the region. Um, North Korea and weapons of proliferation is a serious problem, and it has the potential to cause a cascade of acquisition of nuclear weapons. South Korea is talking about a nuclear deterrent. Um, if South Korea acquires a nuclear deterrent, what would Taiwan think? What would Japan think? This has serious consequences. Um, and then, of course, China is challenging um, the order in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, and, and you know it's belligerent towards Taiwan. And these are serious concerns to Canada. But again, it goes back to my point is that if there's a kinetic conflict across the, the Taiwan Straits, if there's kinetic conflict in the South China Sea or in the East China Sea or in and around the Senkaku Islands, this will disrupt sea lines of communication. It will disrupt the uh, economic relations within the region. And this will spill over to Canada. Um, we buy products. It will disrupt, we buy products from this region. Semiconductors from this region come to Canada. Um, those semiconductors go into the automobile manufacturing companies that employ hundreds of thousands of Canadians. So we can't divorce China from our strategy, but it shouldn't be the central pillar of our strategy. Our strategy must be fixated on this idea of peace and stability and institution building in the region, um, and that we want to adopt a set of policies that contribute to that. And part of that is um, dealing with a more uh, disruptive China, but we also have to find crosswalks to work with China on issues such as climate change, uh, transnational diseases, anti-piracy, illegal fishing, and build the dialogue to deal with um, issues such as uh, code of conduct in the South China Sea. Hmm. Well, speaking of deterrence in the South China Sea, I think uh, last year uh, was the first time ever that Canada and the U.S. Uh, sailed together through the Taiwan transit twice, right? And uh, we're aware that the U.S. has been pushing forward uh, for a uh, integrated deterrence concept, which yep. is deterrence, but with allies and partners uh, across different domains. Do you think uh, we could um, predict that Canada would do something similar in the South China Sea, like what they did with the U.S. in Taiwan Strait? So ultimately, I think that um, Canada has a lot to lose by doing this unilaterally and has a lot more to gain by doing it multilaterally. And here, I think that it's creative formulas to uh, engage in transits through the Taiwan Strait, international waters that are, separate Taiwan and China, or the international waters of the South China Sea. And you know, a good example is um, Canada's engaged in multilateral um, sanctions evasion exercises in, in and around North Korea, and the quickest way to get there is through the Taiwan Straits. But the best way to do that, again, is with a, a multilateral group of countries so that um, it's not seen as Canada acting unilaterally. Um, and, of course, this would be sensitive to China. And I think in the South China Sea as well, it's really important for us to continue to uh, support um, the claims of, of countries within the region 
uh, and to push back against the concept of a nine-dash line and that one country has um, sovereignty over such an enormous body of water uh, with so many resources. And, of course, when you look at it geographically, um, many of these territories are much closer to either Vietnam or the Philippines or um, Indonesia than they are to China. Uh, and I think Canada has a place working in a multilateral setting to uh, continue these transits and to demonstrate that these are international waters and to build that track record. Because international law is about a track record. Mm. And when it ceases having a track record, then it becomes more difficult to advocate that this is mm. really international water. Mm. And I think also in order to uh, put such um, direction into implementations, what you need is resources, right? Yep. And uh, in order to accumulate resource, uh, I think one key part of this, any strategies would be the will of the public yes. and the, uh, yeah, the intentions, the will and the consensus from the public, uh, especially for Canada as a you know, strong democracy. Um, so my next question is also about public opinion. Well, I've read uh, some of the surveys and polls uh, about uh, public opinions in Canada yeah. uh, and the question is what regions do you think have the most strategic value to Canada? And I've seen some of the results saying, oh, it's the Atlantic, it's the Arctic, and uh, the Indo-Pacific hardly comes into uh, yeah, the pictures. So with the uh, commitment from the government to put focus uh, on the Indo-Pacific, but the public seems to be still uh, you know, lacking behind, uh, how do you think would be the best way to uh, fill that gap? Ultimately, it's education and communication from leadership, and that means political leadership sending the signals of why we use this term, Indo-Pacific, but also what is the stakes for Canada within the region. And, you know, when I talk about this to my Canadian audiences, I talk about the $5.5 trillion of trade that go through the South China Sea, East China Sea, in and around Taiwan. $5.5 trillion. That's a lot, right? Um, that's bigger than the Canadian economy. And then I break it down in terms of the amount of trade that Canadian trade goes through the region and how the different challenges within the region could disrupt that and how it would affect ordinary Canadian lives. Uh, I try to talk about, again, if there's a kinetic conflict between Taiwan and China, how would this affect um, the industrial heart of Canada? And what would happen to the hundreds of thousands of jobs that are associated with you know, those first-tier chips that come out of the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company? Um, so these are really important things to be talking about, is how, does it, how would disruptions in the region talk? I personally also think we have to be more consistent in how we talk about the region. So we have an Asia-Pacific, we have an Indo-Pacific, we have East Asia... Um, we have to be consistent in terms of the terms that we use so that the Canadians um, get it. And, you know, I use the dad test, right? I ask my dad, what is the Indo-Pacific? And he looks at me and he says, is that India? And I go, no. And he goes, is that the Pacific? And I, he goes, I go, no. Uh, he doesn't get it, right? So how do we talk to um, the voters, the ordinary stakeholders about this region so that they understand? And that's politicians' jobs. Uh, and hopefully scholars like myself at university that are making people more aware and um, getting that message out in the media. So in a nutshell, uh, more relatable framing and more persistent uh, messaging. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, from your point of view, uh, what do you think is the uh, best way for middle powers or small countries, smaller countries like us, neighboring to such big powers and then having to deal with the dynamic between US and China, which is not always upward, right? So that's a couple questions here. One is how do we deal unilaterally with with our neighbors, the United States and China. And the second one is how do we deal with the repercussions of the U.S.-China um, strategic competition? So I think the reality is, in the Canadian context, that most of our trade is with the United States and Mexico through the NAFTA 2.0 agreement. Um, and as a result, our economic priorities remain uh, wedged in that region, but also our cultural and legal and regulatory framing and how we understand the world. So that relationship is always going to be critical. And in general, our relationship is not coercive. We don't have the same dynamics that I think that Vietnam has with China in terms of um, economic coercion happening at different times when China doesn't like what you do. So your relationship is different. And uh, again, um, how do you manage that bilaterally? Diplomacy is important, more education about each other's systems, more language training about each other's uh, countries um, help build those stronger relationships you can deal with challenges. Now, in terms of the U.S.-China rivalry, the common concern is uh, for middle powers like Canada and Vietnam is how do we avoid being trampled as the elephants are wrestling in the grass, right? And this means that we need to probably form um, coalitions with other middle power countries so that we can push back against economic coercion. We can build uh, other opportunities to cooperate in terms of infrastructure connectivity and help shape the region so we're not being shaped by the region. Um, and that's important. Um, we have to be proactive in our diplomacy. So some good examples is um, when uh, 
uh, China arrested two Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavro, a few years ago, Canada came up with this um, coalition of countries against arbitrary detention. I think this is a great initiative. Uh, primary, mid, primary middle powers joined. The United States supported it as well. And this is where we see um, cooperation between the United States and middle powers to p- push an agenda. But we need to continue to push that agenda and, not, and make sure that you know, we're not only pushing that when the Canadians are arrested, but when other countries' nationals are arrested. So I think that is an interesting mechanism where we work with uh, the United States. Um, but the United States sometimes doesn't play by the same rules that we would like. So we need to also insulate ourselves from some of the challenges um, of that relationship. Um, and this is a lot more complicated because, again, we share a lot of different values. And I think under the former administration, um, Canada was subject to some coercion by um, the U.S. leadership in terms of pushing NAFTA in a different direction. Uh, and that was difficult. And this speaks to the point of working with other middle powers um, like Australia, Japan, New Zealand, uh, European powers and Vietnam to um, forge uh, new partnerships that can insulate us from even coercion from our like-minded partners. And the CTPP is a good example of that, right? It's The um, United States is not part of it, China is not part of it, but we see the members working on labor law, working on environment law, working on digital law, working on limiting the role of state-owned enterprises, uh, focusing on IPR, intellectual property rights protection. So this is an example of coming together as middle powers to kind of create a critical mass of economies that's going to push things in a different direction. So... Um, more of that kind of diplomacy is going to be important. And um, Vietnam, in, with its geographic position in, in Southeast Asia, uh, the size of its country, uh, and its interests suggest that it may be an interesting partner for Canada to work with in terms of expanding the CPTPP, uh, maybe uh, thinking about creative ways for the IPEP, the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, to move forward, or thinking about creative ways to, for example, work with Japan and Canada and Vietnam and maybe South Korea on infrastructure and connectivity building with these mm-hmm. middle powers in the region. So it will take some creative policy making, um, but again, it's think- linking our interests and um, mm-hmm. trying to focus those interests into concrete, um, implementable policies. Mm-hmm. I completely agree, and I think that you know, looking into coalitions of, uh, of middle powers, maybe sometime we will find opportunities that are usually bypassed because we are too focused or too invested in big powers relations, right? Yeah, and it's it's not about, and I think for Vietnam especially, as you have your three no, or four no's, right? Um, you know, friends to all, enemies yeah. of none. That a positive uh, approach to middle power cooperation is focusing on specific initiatives, for example, as bolstering infrastructure and connectivity in Southeast Asia as a way to strengthen strategic autonomy and intra ASEAN integration is a really positive force, and you don't have to be against anybody, right? Mm-hmm. And that is consistent with Vietnam, and they're going to have to continue to thread that needle and work with uh, like minded um, countries on those kinds of issues. Mm. Yeah, and I think I would like to end uh, the podcast, this episode of the From the Sea podcast here with that note, yes, diversifications, right, working with other partners and focusing on uh, middle powers as well. Uh, well, before we end the podcast, uh, I heard that, uh, yeah, you're from Calgary, right? Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Born and raised in Calgary. Born and raised in yeah. Calgary, known for the Calgary Stampede, uh, carnivores. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they're not very uh, pro-Ottawa, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. somehow uh, I... Grew up there being, you know, multilingual. I'm an omnivore, and uh, I'm not exactly anti-Ottawa. So, you know, uh, a flower can bloom out of a desert. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, actually, the lesson of that, I mean, is that you know, there's lots of aspects of Canada. Uh, Calgary is one of them, and uh, yeah, they can you can come out of a, a city like Calgary and, and, and do a lot of interesting things in, in this region. Well, but I, I mean, everything has both sides. So, uh, growing up in that place, uh, I heard. From you know through the grapevines that it uh, led you to somewhat a career in uh, skiing. Uh, yes, I used to uh, be on the Canadian Disabled Ski Team, and that was my first trip to Asia actually, uh, mm-hmm. and it opened my eyes to the region and all the changes and the growth. And I think it speaks to how um, you know we can have unorthodox back, uh, backgrounds and experiences that lead us to different uh, end destinations in life. So for me, my first taste of Asia was through skiing, okay. uh, and it left a lasting impression. Where now I'm based in the regions and get to be part of the interesting discussions about the Indo-Pacific and where Canada's going in the region. Yeah, and that's what brought us here today in Hanoi, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Well, uh, it's good to see you in Hanoi again and uh, definitely looking forward to other chances to sit down and have a conversation like this. On my next visit, uh, let's do it over a cup of coffee and a banh mi or a, a pho. Oh, yes, sure. And then uh, also just to, you know, for shameless promotions, uh, Bon Iver, which is a great, great, great uh, indie folk experimental band. Mm-hmm. They're from the U.S., but they had a, a song called uh, Calgary, oh. which is beautiful, beautiful. And uh, they got their heart broken and they locked themselves in a wood cabin in the woods and they produced a Grammy-winning album. <laughs> will, will this be on our on the link for the podcast? I think so. I'll be playing the song after this. Great. I look forward to it. Thanks again. Thanks. See you. Don't you cherish me? I'm uh...
Never keep your eyelids clear And hold me for the pops and clears I was only for the father's crib Oh, the demons come, they can't subside. 